You know, there are people <clears throat> in the world that don't believe any of this is real. They really don't believe it. And as a matter of fact, I've seen more this past year and expect because of the times and seasons that in this coming year, you're going to see a bigger display of anti-Christian, not just against Christianity, denouncing that it's real altogether, just the way that they're setting the things up uh, against the J or Jewish brothers and sisters. The way that the power, prince of power of the air and things are happening in the earth, we're at a time that we really, really need to make sure we've established and grounded ourselves in what we believe. And I mean go back to the fundamentals, back to the old days of we had Sunday school and Bible classes, and when people thought when we were little and young, yeah, we were little and young ones, right? <laughs> we weren't paying attention, but I remember so much from those days about how real God is and how much he loves us. And as we get older, we tend to hear it over and over and over so much. I'm not going to say we're callous to it, but we kind of get used to it. <clears throat> so what I'm going to share with you today that God's put on my heart, as always, it's something that he gets on me and then I get on you. <laughs> He shares with me, I share with you. Uh, it's exciting, it's a challenge, it, a little of it's going to take us back to a place that will make us uncomfortable, which is a good thing. You know, surgeons are good because God has put them here. And when someone is injured or harmed, when they take the knife and the scalpel and they enter the body, if your body could speak, it would say, please don't do that anymore. You're hurting, you're cutting. But it's a healing, it's, it's administering healing to you, an avenue to you. And I'm grateful that the Bible is a two-edged sword and it's also a spiritual scalpel, if you will. It separates spirit, soul, and the Bible says joints and marrow, but what it really is saying is spirit, soul, and body. It helps us understand the reality of this thing we're living called Christianity. This experience we have that we are saved. So today we're going to take a step back, not backwards, just a step back to get a good full view, a panoramic view of what's most important, what's been important this past year and what's coming up in the year ahead. But before we start down that, I'm going to say it's going to be a little roller coaster ride. And Tom preached some of my stuff already. So whenever he took, we did communion, so. We'll just go a little lighter on that part. But here's some scriptures that'll make you feel great. This is kind of like rubbing it just before we're hit with something that God's going to really use in a great and exciting way for us. First Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.8, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Sometimes we hear amen, and we, we say, that's like in church, we say, yeah, I agree with you, preacher. Amen. But what it means is, so be it. It will be so. There's an eternal value to it. And when the Lord spoke this, he amened himself here. And what he's saying is, I am alive forevermore. And it will be so. It is so and it will be so. Revelation 21.4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. They've passed away. We use that phrase when a loved one leaves this world, this physical place. Well, let me tell you, in this context, this is where death dies. This is where pain dies. This is where sorrow dies. <laughs> this is where crying dies. There's a day that it's going to stop. There's an end to it. And boy, aren't you glad that you're a part of that body that's living it now and will experience it then and we have no fear about what's going to happen between now and then. But a lot 
is left to do between now and then. We've already been in the now and then in the past, and we're still there. And I'm going to share with you just a moment what the subject is. You've probably heard it. It's not anything cute or that you've heard before, but it's something that I hope will bring focus to our life, fresh focus. Here's my scriptures I want to share. Those were the goodies. These are the, in, the introspective ones. James 4, 13, 17. Go to now, you say that today and to, or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there for a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. But now you're rejoicing in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is evil. I like, lately, I like to overlay that with a more modern, some modern words. That changes the meaning of it, but it puts it in a more palatable context for us. I'll read it again from a different version. And now I have a word for you who, brash, who brashly say, Today, at least, or at least tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for the year, and we're going to start a business, and we're going to make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog. <laughs> wow. I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all principality and power. Just hush for a minute, you whisper of fog. <laughs> you are, but we're still living in a place where there's a purpose and a need. Heaven's a wonderful place. And when this vapor goes away, we're there. What a wonderful thing. But we're not there now, we're here now. And what we will be there needs to be here now in our body. On earth, as it is in heaven. In us, as it is in heaven. That's our challenge. And it's a challenge, and it's a real challenge. It's the highest challenge. <clears throat> We've all been to cemeteries, seen the headstones. And I somehow I got snookered in. I, I, did, I knew what I was getting into. I wanted to find out where all the famous people were buried, right? You know, you're clicking along on the internet and committing the sin of wasting time and, oh, well, whatever. And you run across that and you, I found a website that shows where they were and it shows a little snippet of what they did and whatever. And it's interesting, the people who have the biggest names and the, the global influence and their names will go on to ever, like John Wayne and Elizabeth Taylor and all these people, they have little bitty plaques that says, Here's a name. Some of them are pretty grandiose, but for the most part, here's a name, here's a date, and a dash, and a date. The date they're born, the dash, and the date they die. Now, as Christians, we know that's a particular kind of death. That's the physical death. It's still very real in this earth now, still very much on this side of the fullness of the gospel. We are born again. We're alive in Christ. We're going to live forever somewhere. Right now, that time is on this planet in this body. This body doesn't hold up too well, though. Did you ever notice that? Sure you did. Look around. We, there's people we don't see here anymore. And let's just be real, folks. That physical part of our being we're spirit, soul, and body, threefold beings, just like the Father is a threefold being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In kind of the same way, we're spirit, soul, and body. Spirit and soul are the parts we don't see, but we see evidence of, and we're motivated by it. And through the soul, we think and reason, have emotions. Through the spirit, the life force, the breath of God, we live. And we're all right now compacted inside this body <laughs> that has swollen fingers and achy backs, and when you get out of bed in the morning, it's easier to just stay there sometimes, right? <laughs> and we limp, and we crawl, and we get ill sometimes. Jesus provided ways we can pray for that. Through him, by his stripes, we're healed. He's given us the tools, the faith, the ability to manage this physical life, actually to master it as best as we can, but the body still does what it does. <clears throat> Do you know why? Why is it someone who can come to church and stand up with one of the most 
mightiest testimonies we'd ever heard. <clears throat> but three weeks later, they're gone. I had a friend of mine, dear, dear friend of mine, loved the Lord with all his heart, committed his entire life to Jesus, great things ahead, going to do, left the ministry where he was, got in a little airplane with his 15-year-old son, at, got, and got, at his God's will and direction to go to Alaska and fly there. He was an experienced pilot. He didn't make it past Minnesota. And I'm standing there thinking, <clears throat> with God, nothing's impossible. I'm seated in heavenly places. He's in heavenly places. Lord, why? 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 How? And I can't tell you that I understand all that. I know the good parts of our faith. I know how to say my faith. I do my best to live my faith. Feeble as it is, fail as I do. I fall a thousand times. I can still get up because the hand is there to help me. But I don't have all those answers. One of the worst disease I know of, I don't, I've never had all these diseases, but I hear the word cancer a lot. Brings fear across the world to people who hear it. We stand up against it. We put energy toward it. Research. We pray. We believe for healing. We've seen healing. We've seen full recoveries. But we've also seen those we love and know who live strong, godly lives with much potential ahead of them. They're gone. Because we brashly say, tomorrow, I got a business plan. Tomorrow, I'm going to go and establish myself there and I'm going to do the things I need to do and make a lot of money, have a lot of influence, fulfill the call of God in my life, love people. <clears throat> the world has a different definition of that. Get all you can. My papa, mamma used to say this. Get what you can and can what you get. And I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, down there, canning means preserve it. <laughs> so get what you can, can what you get, get more. Then you're gone. For the believer that's gone, we really just arrive there. To be absent from the body is what? Who knows? To be present with the Lord. Not even at light speed. That's not even close to how fast we're in his presence when we leave this body. We don't fall asleep and in non-existent slumber for eternity. I've heard a lot of that the last few days. And if you listen to it over and over, and they show you pictures of the universe and outer space, how big it is and how small we are, and they say, there's no evidence, blah, blah, blah. Shh. I need to go back to the basics in my heart and expose myself, not to the, the, the glitter and the focus of the, the greatest telescope we ever made in outer space, showing places light years away, telling me that this is what it was, what we see now is what happened a billion years ago. I can tell you what happened a few thousand years ago. I don't need a telescope to know that. I know what the cross is. I know what the empty grave is. And with all that other high-tech stuff invading my mind, I have to remember that tomorrow I might get in my car and I might not make it over there. Oh, Kurt, that's, is that speaking faith? Hey, I, nobody can ever say that I don't try to live by faith. I don't always do well at it. Sometimes it's like I got three feet or no feet <laughs> trying to walk in faith. But I love the Lord. And I can speak of things that are not as though they were. And no, that's not a religion in itself. God's not my slave. He doesn't do what I say just because I say it. My heart has to be in tune with his in order for the words to have power to create things like love and community and healing and peace. But the biggest thing I need to focus on now with all that stuff coming in against my mind, trying to flood me more now than ever, to drain me of what I know is that we're just a vapor. We're, we're God's vapor. When we leave this vaporous time, we'll be in a in that very real place that's more real than now, what we know. But this body does have its limitation. In the old days, growing up in the South, and Tim knows what the ha 
half means when preachers, they start preaching like this because they can't get their breath. And we drive through Kentucky going to Virginia, and you can't understand what they're saying, but you hear a lot of the has trying to grasp the breath because they can't say the good stuff fast enough. They can't keep up breathing with it. That's where that comes from. So it's good if you can hear it. But those days, people used to preach fire and brimstone, and they would say things that would literally scare people to come to Christ. You don't know, brother, when you get in the car, if you're ever going to get out. When you walk in that door, if you'll come out the other side. You don't know, you don't know, you know. We don't have to live in that fear. The reality in the flesh is there is a lot of that stuff now. Still in this world, we have to deal, we have to cope. But we are victorious over it. Why? Because the worst it can do to us is put us in the presence of God. So knowing that, we can live fearlessly. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but what? What three things? Power, love, a sound mind. Spirit, soul, and body in there. Completeness in there. We don't have to live in fear because death is not death like the world thinks it is. To people who don't know Jesus, it is. And as much as I wanted to go off and preach one of them old southern sermons and have everybody's eyes look like deer in the headlights and think, wow, I haven't heard that in a long time. You know you got to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that eternity, your life in eternity will be in heaven with him, with loved ones, where there is no crying and death doesn't exist anymore. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's not waiting for you, not waiting for me. It's just the way it is. But what the Lord has instructed me to talk about is the dash. Date of birth, May 25th, 1958. <clears throat> 68. Okay, Lord, 58. <laughs> I gotta tell the truth. Love it. 65 plus years. The dash. Date of death, date of home going, physical death. Don't know what that is yet, but there's a dash. We live in the dash. You're alive in the dash. You know, when you, how many have computers? You know what I'm talking about? Computers, yeah, they're those newfangled things. When you start something, you get that little bar that goes. Remember the internet when it first came out? Boing, boing, jing, jing. Man. That thing ever going to get to the end? Well, in physical life, we see that getting close to the end. We go, whoa. It's, it's a dash. Some dashes go zip. The saddest thing I've ever seen is a baby's grave. Then we go and we see someone who's been blessed to live 80, 90, 100 years. Oh, they lived a good life. Yep. And just from the standpoint of the physical, I don't mean the spiritual, if they could talk in the standpoint of the physical, they'd still rather be here than what that body is. Loretta Lynn, the great prophetess that she was, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Right? Do you want to go? How many want to go to heaven here today? How many are living in the dash today? Every single one of you. <laughs> Do you know what your life expectancy is on the planet Earth? Zero. At some point, we sent a brother who was part of this body. We honored him. We recognized him. He was in heaven in this space. Some of our parents, some of our brothers, our sisters, we've all celebrated their life. We don't have to call them funerals anymore. It's a goodbye here, but they're with Jesus. They, man, they are way better off than us. But that dash for here has an end. What are we going to do in our dash. How are we going to live our dash? What Tom said during the communion, and this isn't going to be real long unless you want it to be. <laughs> Amen? Okay. <laughs> I could preach into the new year, but that is a bit long. <clears throat> For 2024, it's good to have a plan. It's a concise picture of what we call a successful business, successful person. We have a plan, we have a place in mind, and we pursue profit or success. Nothing appears wrong with it, but the scripture points out to us that not allowing for the known and unknown will of God, we know God who knows his will, and we can know his will if we seek and search and pray, and, but there's parts we still don't know. We're still on this side of the veil. Seen through a glass darkly, the scripture says. Though, but 
not allowing for the known or unknown will of God in our plans, is boasting in our own selves, and the scripture says it's evil. He says it's sinful. What we should say is, well, if it's the will of the Lord and I'm alive tomorrow, I'll do this or that. I don't say things like that, do you? Well, Kurt, you know what I mean. Well, but the words are still important. If, if you know what I mean, then God could have just said, well, let there be, yeah, you know, whatever the thing is, light, yeah, world, whatever. You know what I want. I want existence, so just say. No, he said what he wanted it to be. Words are important. <clears throat> if I looked at my wife and I said, yeah, you know, you know how I feel. I don't have to say it. Shame on me. I love you. When people are angry at one another, here, reach out here in your reach outedness and your ability to touch the texture of the, these words and see what this feels like. Man, I hate. This is disgusting. This stinks. I'm going to kill. I'm going to murder. You can feel that. That those words are real. How much greater are the words that says, I forgive you. I've done all kinds of evil. Shh. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Covers those sins. Those words sound great. Don't, don't just say, well, that blood was shed for something or another. No, take time. Go back to focus. Say it over and over again. Get some spiritual lotion and rub that callus where we're just so used to hearing it all the time. Jesus died for my sins, John 3, 16. Stop. Peel the skin back. Peel the spirit back. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I'm a forgiven person living in a gap on a planet that's fallen completely apart. Why do good people die? Why do... Precious people who would say, we, we think they believe they have a great plan of God for their life, then they're gone. <clears throat> Did the devil sneak in and get them? He's not smart enough. He's not strong enough. He doesn't know everything. He's the devil. He's not Jesus and God. He, Jesus has no rival. He said, I am the Lord of heaven and earth. I was alive and I was dead. And I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death, hell, the grave, and the devil's party place, the earth. But you know what the Bible says? A little theology lesson here, so stay with me. The Bible says sin is condemned in the flesh, sealed in the flesh. Your flesh, because of a whole bunch of other religious and theological things, and you can study it in your own, that's why the world's still full of physical humanity there's still sicknesses and disease in the world, not because you committed a sin. You're not sick because you sinned. That's a joke. Your body responds to sin. Your body wants to die. It wants to kill itself. Alcohol, drugs, hate, stupid decisions, mistakes, and sometimes not mistakes, some things, dumb things on purpose. These, this body wants to kill itself. That's all it is. Death is in this side, this dispensation. We live on a planet where we're born and the body starts dying right away. And people put it in their language. Well, I'm scared to death. You kids stop there. Oh, my dad's going to kill me if he finds this out. <clears throat> no, I'm not. Well, no, I'm not. <clears throat> I told my kids, don't ever think that. Yeah, I'd be angry when you do bonehead things. But don't ever, ever think my dad's going to kill me. It's just words, you know what I mean, yeah. Don't say it. Don't believe. If you don't believe it, don't say it. What a challenge that is for me. You can do with it what you want. That's a challenge for me. We have to order what's in our... Did you know the Bible says that out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks? Well, but people know what words mean. Yeah, but let's pay attention and focus to the real words here. We live in the dash. We live in a very small time. This year that just passed, what did you do with your dash? Mine was a roller coaster. And there's still time left in it. <laughs> there's a lot of pain and ups and downs and sideways. And it's not what's in front of you, the ups and downs. It's 
What's going on back there? How's your dash been? What does your dash look like for this year? <clears throat> going to make it to this time next year with your dash? We plan as if we are, and we should. You know why we should plan? You should plan like you're going to live forever. Because you are. Your body isn't. It's just not. Well, Kurt. Yep, it's not. But to the believer who has meet the end of that dash, if you saw graphically what it is, it would go, it would be an up arrow, infinite. Because yes, you're going to live forever, but what are you going to do during the dash while you're here? What are we going to do? We need, how then should we live in the dash here on earth? I skipped the part that I want to go back to if I have time, but I'm not, I need to get to this first. How then should we live in this dash on earth? We need to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and accept all that accompanies that decision. Oh, the blessing and the peace and the forgiveness and the struggle and the attacks and the turmoil. Well, wait a minute. Don't talk about that, Kurt. We want this year to be exciting and good. Yeah, it's going to be. <clears throat> we have some weights to lift this year. Don't have to lift them alone. You're going to be challenged this year. You don't have to meet them alone. Right? This year is going to be full of great, great opportunities. My sister's testimony is awesome. I think... And I believe you'll see greater things than you've ever seen in the body of Christ. And I thought that, and I thought, maybe I should talk about that just to get everybody fired up about the new year. But like any good race that's worth finishing, do you know, have you ever watched the Olympic races or gone to a track meet? The fastest people, you know what the very first thing is they do? They take a step back. And they squat. <clears throat> Wait a minute. You're not going to break any records going backwards. Hmm, let's start the year out. Let's take a step back. Let's squat. And let's get ready. But Kurt, how are you going to take off from there? Greater is he that's in me. I don't need to do the taking off. He'll tell me when. He'll tell me how. And if for some reason that I know or don't know, I'm suddenly with him, I'm not afraid if that's going to happen. In fact, we need to plan as if we're living forever in the dash, though we're not. We need to plan and work. But we need to be ready as if it could be instantly gone. Because if it's not instant, it's still inevitable. So there's a reality here that as we move into the new year... <clears throat> Yeah, we're marching victorious, triumphant, excited, waving flags and whatever. Yeah, absolutely. But let's get ready. Let's focus. Let's we won't see those great things that the Lord's going to do this year until we are prepared, until we're on purpose prepared, not just flippantly, yeah, I know it, I'll believe it when I see it. No, you won't. But if you have eyes to see, Ears to hear, if you've taken that step back and you've knelt and you've prayed before you start this race, then you'll see it and you'll appreciate it. Sometimes it'll happen and you won't even know it's happening if you're just flipping about it. But when you stay focused and realize I have a, a small amount of time in the dash, then you'll see them for what they are. <clears throat> I want to say this and then I, the end of my message, it's like those internet teasers. It's a big surprise when I'm going to get to the end, so stay around until the end, okay? <clears throat> Tim mentioned, what, how long were you, how many Christmases have you guys been here, Lisa? 27? Something like that? Is that right? Yeah, 27. I'm sorry. He said it, you didn't. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Check this out. Um, uh, we're a vapor. That phrase doesn't necessarily mean our lives are going to be unexpectedly cut short, but it doesn't exclude that either. If the Lord wills and we live, the scripture says, we will do this or do that. And of course, on a long enough timeline, everyone's um, survival rate is zero. Even if our life expectancy is 79 years plus, like they are in the United States, 
That's an average of male and female from the statistic I got. You may have different statistics, but let's just say 79 years for reference. If you're now 35, you only have 531 months to live in the gap, in the dash. You only have 44 more Christmases. If you're 45, you have 411 months or 34 more Christmases. 34 more times. Jingle bells, Batman smells. If, I'm, I'm doing Christmas like a kid, okay? If you're 55, you have 291 months. My father-in-law is, how old are you, Ron? 80, 112? Oh. <laughs> 79, I'm past that now. Don't worry, it gets good for you too. If you're 55, you have 291 months, 24 more Christmases before you're 79. Or if you're 65, thank you, Jesus. I got 51 more months, 14 more Christmases. If you're 75, four more Christmases. And if you're 80 and above, congratulations, you're in bonus time. <laughs> now, that's what life expectancy is here, physical life expectancy. Um, the fact is, there's things on the internet you can put different information in, and it'll tell you when you're going to die. You'd be surprised at people that do that. I've never done it. Because when you see it in writing and it's on the internet, you know it's true. It, it's got to be true. <laughs> I've seen five-headed people. It's got to be true. Yeah, well, you're on the same page with me. So how should we live, knowing how short this dash opportunity is? We should live like a dog. <laughs> well, puppy love leads to a dog's life. Oh. Why do I say live like a dog? No. You know, a dog years are like seven years because somebody said that, I guess. There's a reason. I don't know. But if that's true, that means that every day for a dog is like a week for us. And the dog gets, did you know your dog, any dog for the most part, gets all of life out of it that they can if they're good dogs? Did you notice every time you, you could leave out the door, shut it, and two minutes later come in and they say, oh, you're back, you're back. I thought you were never coming back. Wow! <laughs> How then should we live? When the master says, come, you don't have to say come. When you walk in the door, I remember when our patches was with us, we'd walk in the door, hey, don't go that way, come this way, back and forth, whatever. You'd say, food, walk, vet, oh. <laughs> come on. <laughs> we should live. You know what I'm saying. The same vigor, the same passion, compassion. Just as a reference, every day is precious. Literally, the next second, you could be with Jesus. Literally. And don't apply all the spiritual, spiritually anchored scientific formula to it, confessions, things to it. Yes, I believe in all those things. The Bible says, if you honor your mother and father, that you might live long on the earth. God defines long. That's why the scripture said that very puzzling thing. A day is as a thousand years. A thousand years. It means he doesn't have to keep our timetable. We might think we have something till that point. That point. That point. And we may well do it. And we should plan to do it and have faith in God to do it because of the level of knowledge and understanding that we attain. And we should always have a desire to continue to attain more and to understand more. God isn't withholding understanding. He said in Proverbs, with all thy getting, get understanding. But tomorrow might come and you're with Jesus. Oh, it happens. And we need to be ready for that. We don't think that way. I got to run to chief. I'll be back in a minute. Don't be afraid to go to chief. Go to chief. I got to go to Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Witness to the waitress. Share the good news. Plan to do that. Keep doing that over and over because you probably will go. Likely you will go. Hardly any doubt that you will go, but you might not make it. Does that mean the devil wins? No, because here's how smart he is, little and limited as he is. He kills us, we're with Jesus, and he can't kill you anyway. Well, death, death. Well, who has the keys of death and hell and the grave? The Lord does. 
So there's some still mystery things in there we have to live by faith with. I'm not saying don't get confused. Don't let it stop you. Love the Lord. Believe with all your heart. Live forever in your mind. This body will fall off at some point, either in 10 minutes or 200 years. I don't know. And those people way back in the early Old Testament, 979 years. Are you kidding me? (laughs) I hope they had skin lotion back then. That would be. (laughs) And I hear people say, I don't think I'd want to live that long. Yeah, have you ever been right there? I haven't. Where the next breath will stop? You'd stay around. Oh, heaven's waiting for me. There's people who've been there and they want to go on. Yep, that's right. That's good. But physical death is formidable in the flesh It's the thing the world fears more than anything. The fear of death. And what's the one thing, the main thing, the total thing Jesus removed is the fear of death. Hell and the grave. Because you know when I speak, the Lord always tells me, I don't just do one thing for you guys. It's multiple and exponential. Not the spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. Keys of death, hell, and the grave. We're seated in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, my dominion. But you might not make it through tomorrow. Are you ready to continue to live the very best you can in the dash that you have left in 2004? Probably your dash will extend past it. Maybe not. Will the maybe not end in a beautiful testimony that will cause other people's dashes to turn to Jesus. That's where it's at. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for our pastor and his wife and the family. Thank you for their leadership, their love, their drive, their determination for this church, this community. Lord, I ask that this year coming up, just like my sister said, not for the sake of being of bragging or anything else, Lord, but for the, the, the sake of the lost and for the glory of you, that many souls will be saved, that many miracles will be seen, that we'll experience things that we can't even think about or put into context right now, that we feel God move in such a mighty way. So I agree with my sister's word in that regard, that it'll all be under the leadership and within the humility and the love that our pastor and Lisa have for this body. Thank you for them. Bless them with health Bless them with safety. Bless them with wisdom and strength, Lord, and all their family. And Lord, bless this church. Every person here, people that will be here that aren't here now, some that won't be with us maybe when the end of this year, this dash comes. But we thank you that we have this opportunity now. Help us take this real part of our life, the lives we live at home and at work. And you know my heart, Lord. You know my life. And just like everyone else in this church body, it's not perfect. There's challenges. There's disagreements. There's also love. There's harmony. It's all that big mix of things that happens to everybody. But Lord, help us to find you in all of it and give you glory for it so that if our dash ends tomorrow, next week, next month, or if it doesn't, that you still be praised. And if there's any here in this room now that don't know you as Lord and Savior, not just that you do save people, but that they need you, Lord. I pray you'll speak to their heart now, the Holy Spirit, to convict them, to spread your love into their heart so that they can know you as Savior. Let's keep your eyes closed, and if you would be kind enough to bow your head. I just want to know if someone is here that would like prayer or would like to acknowledge that you need Jesus. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time, maybe not. But if you want to ask Jesus into your heart today, just nobody's going to look. Nobody's going to peek right now. Just let me see your hands so I can pray. If you're comfortable that you're in the dash, your dash is bookended with Jesus on both sides, then you don't have to live in fear. My prayer for you is that you be blessed, you be healed, you be thrilled. You'll be protected that God's grace will flow out of you, that more love will come out than persecutions would come against so that people can see the glory of the Lord in your life. May your families be blessed with health and love in Jesus' name. Amen.